Welcome everyone. Welcome to our online workshop on building your first machine learning model here at Code Heroku. My name is Mihir Thakkar. I am the founder and instructor at Code Heroku. And we are an education platform which is trying to make world class computer science and engineering education accessible to millions of students out there and especially in developing countries like ours, India. So, what we try to do is we want to make sure that uh, the same level and the quality of education which is access available to people in developed countries like United States or somewhere in Europe, we make the same level of education accessible to people in developing countries in an online setting, right? Because that's the only way we can reach so many people. So that is what we do. In our today's class, what I want to do is make sure that I give you enough insights into what machine learning is, how do you get started in a with your career in machine learning and hopefully we'll be able to uh, you know, give you some insights into that and also this is a hands-on session so we'll, this is not just like me talking but we'll do build our machine learning models together and we'll be using a cloud-based service so you don't need to install anything but before I get started I want to get a sense of who all are there in uh, audience with us today so I want to see uh, you know at what stage you guys are in in terms of you no know, are you thinking of transitioning to uh, like how serious are you uh, about transitioning to an ml or data science career so let me know in the chat box you could say you could say serious if you are like really thinking into transitioning to data science or machine learning based careers or you could say i'm just exploring so let me know in the chat box i would like to get a sense of no uh, no who all are there in the audience today and what are they expecting with from this session so i want to know from you guys go there to the chat box and tell me if you're just exploring and you no know, just trying to learn new things uh, you could say exploring or you could say serious about transitioning so that i know that you actually want to transition to a machine learning career and uh, no again for both of the audiences we will try to do our best and you know, provide some value All right, so a lot of people, Razim, uh, you know, Sagar, they are saying that they are serious about transitioning now and switching to a machine learning career. So we have some people who are also exploring, just trying to learn what machine learning is. And uh, I'll try my best to you know, deliver uh, you know, value this uh, Sunday evening to uh, both our segments over there. Okay. So thanks again for coming. I know it must be a tiring week before. I know you're just getting started for you know, prepping for tomorrow. And uh, you still came to this online session and you know, are with us. So thank you again. Um, let's get in and let me tell you what do I have in house for you today. The first thing we'll see is why machine learning is so useful. And suddenly we are hearing this buzz around machine learning, data science. It's a similar kind of buzz when you know, mobile apps initially came out, right? And you know, even things like blockchain and those things, a, uh, you know, augmented reality, there is a lot of buzz going around these things. So, but is like the buzz around ML, like really, uh, you know, is there really meat inside there? Is it just buzzwords or it's like really useful? And I, I'll try to you know, uh, talk more about why is ML so useful? Then once you understand that, you know what, really, yes, ML is useful, then you'll see what ML is from a mathematical perspective as well. And I'll try to connect it with things that you already know from your high school um, and not just give you a Wikipedia definition, right? Uh, so I, that's something that I try to avoid a lot over here in Code Heroku. I don't want to give you out uh, things that you can already learn by yourself online but I'll try to give you insights which is not possible to get reading some blogs or those kind of things then we'll dive in and actually build a machine learning model we'll try to study some concepts before in in the class and then we'll switch to the hands-on session for today we'll build a machine learning model using python on a service called azure notebooks i'm not sure if some of you have heard of it but it's pretty easy. We'll get started over there. Don't worry if you haven't worked on Python before. You will understand it. And then we'll also talk about machine learning career track at Code Heroku. So let's say after we complete our hands-on session, you feel like, you know what? I really like the way 
Mihir approaches uh, the teaching at Code Hiraku. What you could do is you know, also learn more about our machine learning career track. And we'll be also giving out tuition waivers for our long-term program. So if someone is already interested in signing up for our long-term programs, you might be interested in staying back till the end because we'll, for a couple of minutes, we'll open up the link, which will enable you to get tuition waivers. Okay. So that's the agenda. Let me tell you why, let, let's just first see why, what makes computers really useful before even I talk about what makes machine learning so powerful. I want to ask you guys that over here, you see two pictures on the left. We have a washing machine, which, and on the right, we have few computing devices, such as a mobile phone, a desktop with some apps open over there. And if I tell you that devices on the right are far more useful than the washing machine on the left, I think most of you would agree with me on that, right? That we can't even live without our mobile phones these days and our computers these days. So what makes the devices on the right so more useful than the device on the left? And again, both, if you think about it, they kind of have the same things inside them. They have microprocessor, they both have memory, right? But what makes the devices on the right far more useful than the devices on the, the washing machine on the left? Can you guys tell me? And again, guys, let's keep this session interactive. I don't want this to be a one-way stream. Don't think of it as just a webinar where someone is speaking. Uh, this is more of a discussion between you and me. And that's how you make most out of a live session. You could have also watched this as a recording. After this class, I'll be sending out the recorded video as well. But those folks might not be able to interact with me. Right, but you are over here in the live session, so make the most out of it. Go to the chat box, let's talk over here. And my question to you is what makes the devices on the right far more useful than the washing machine on the left? So I'm seeing multiple purposes with mobile, multiple functions, handy, daily use, multitasking is possible. Yeah, so all of those are great insights. And uh, someone, Hari, said that multiple purposes with the devices on the right, right? Because uh, with your cell phone today, you could do so many different things. You can browse the internet. You can send someone an email. You can take pictures, right? So many different things. But with the washing machine, you could just do one specific task, which is washing clothes, right? So the word that I was looking for is they are general purpose computing devices. So devices on the right are general purpose. That's what makes our computers. They are programmable as based on know what users need. Uh, that what makes computers really useful today and you no know, devices such as mobile phones, a uh, you know, lot more useful as well. Okay, so now that you understand that, now I want you to think what makes machine learning so useful, right? Uh, so back in the olden days, even without machine learning, you could have done something like this, wherein some computer scientists could have gone in and said, if there is a black pixel, which is starting from five pixels away from a white pixel, that is where the cat, the face of the cat starts, and then draw a rectangle of 200 by 200 on this image, okay? So you could have hard coded some if else statements and created some rules to draw this rectangle. But with machine learning, we are getting something like this over here. And now I want you to think and tell me, why do you think is machine learning so useful and try to correlate it with what you see just one slide before, wherein there was something on the left, which was doing something very specific and then something on the right. So can you tell me from the analogy that we just saw before, with the washing machine and computers, why do you think machine learning is so useful and powerful? So I see, uh, Razim saying predict different pixels helps to classify and predict. Someone says distinguish between different varieties of cat. 
generalize is better. So Shantanu got that bang on over there. What you are seeing over here is, let's say even if you have a four-year-old kid and then you uh, know, show them this brown-colored cat, they will be able to still make, make it up, right? They will be still able to understand that, hey, you know what, even this is a cat, irrespective of this is a black color or brown color. But over here, what you had to do is go inside your program and change your algorithm to say, hey, you know what, even if it is a brown color, not the black color, it is still a cat. Right. So the things with machine learning is that it generalizes a problem much more better. And it's not just explicit rule based programming that you see over here. And the effect of this is you don't have to rewrite your programs every time you want to solve similar problems. So let's say if it is Google Photos, does it make sense for Google to rewrite a face recognition algorithm that they have in Google Photos? for each person on this planet is it even feasible can they rewrite their programs every time for a new person is it even feasible will it work no it's not even feasible in a lot of cases it's not even feasible right and that's where machine learning comes in because and we'll see some examples as well, wherein you know, we'll do something like a digit recognition uh, system uh, in our course, wherein you could imagine how many ways someone could write a handwritten digit, right? So if you go with a rule-based programming, it's not necessarily that you will always get better results as well. Uh, sometimes it's not even possible, okay? So let me tell you, before we go that, uh, I just want to make sure that we all are on the same page with this one. So which of the following statement is false? Machine learning can be used to build autonomous vehicles. Machine learning is useful because accuracy of results are always better than rule-based programming. Machine learning algorithm generalizes a problem well and thus we do not rewrite our models for variations of the same problem. Can you guys tell me which of the following statement is false? Again, guys, think about it properly. And Chantanu, it's not a trick question. There is one uh, statement over there which is false. So think about it properly. Yep, now you guys got that right that the second statement is false over here. We all know that machine learning and AI in general have been applied to build autonomous vehicles. The third statement over here, we just saw that machine learning algorithm generalizes the problem well. And thus we do not have to rewrite our models to solve the variations of the same problem, right? So one and three are definitely true. The second one over here, machine learning is useful because accuracy of results are not necessarily always better than rule-based programming, right? So if the problem is uh, really simple enough, then the rule-based programming might even work. But in many cases, you know, things which are very intuitive to us and but are not very intuitive to teach to computers, what happens is machine learning becomes far more useful than rule-based programming, okay? So I hope you guys are on this, uh, are with me on this. A lot of people have this question about differences between machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the new word that we have seen in recent days is also deep learning, right? So what is the difference between these things? So let me tell you what artificial intelligence is. Artificial intelligence as a field has been there for quite a some time now, right? So ever since the advent of computers, we as humans always wanted to make our machines or our computers as smart as us. Right, so this branch of computer science, which deals with making artificially intelligent agents or artificially intelligent uh, algorithms uh, is called artificial intelligence. So there are various components that make up this artificial intelligence. And one of them is machine learning. So before I talk about more about machine learning, I just want to highlight 
uh, something called as Turing's test, which came in 1950s. Turing, yeah, sure, Dinesh. So let let me get to machine learning in a while. But before that, let me tell you about Turing's test. So there was this guy named Turing in 1950s. Uh, he came up with a statement or a test called as Turing's test. What he said that if a machine is able to fool a human, that it's not a machine but an another human then i'll attribute or i'll give this machine the stature of being an artificially intelligent agent or no it will be i'll call them call this as a true artificial intelligence if this machine can fool another human that it's not a machine but another human itself okay so and a lot of people and so it's kind of philosophical explanation but a lot of people still hold hold on to it so then around 1960s, what happens is uh, people thought that these methods don't work. The artificial intelligence, uh, no, these kind of things that people are researching, they don't really work in practice. And the reason was, no, at those in those days, we did not have enough compute power and we did not have enough uh, data as well to work on with, right? So people said, you know what, the rule-based programming is much better, so don't even worry about these things. So this phase is also called as winter of AI. And that's where this Game of Thrones reference is coming in. I'm not sure if you guys got that. And then we have around 1980s, uh, machine learning started becoming popular and specifically statistical machine learning. So there was this subset of algorithms which use, which had no foundations in statistics, which started becoming popular. And companies like Google, Nvidia, and start these these companies started heavily investing in these algorithms and in the research in these technologies okay and that's where machine learning started becoming more popular and in recent days we have seen that after 2010 uh, a subset of algorithms which are called as deep deep learning algorithms have started becoming more popular these deep learning algorithms use something called as neural networks and these neural networks are modeled by the are modeled from a human brain. They are loose models of what is happening inside your head. So what computer scientists did was they, they got inspiration from our, the biological structure of neurons that is there inside our brains. And that's where the neural networks came, uh, no, were, were born. And these subset of machine learning algorithms which use neural networks for their operation, they are called deep learning algorithms. And we are seeing companies like DeepMind, OpenAI, heavily uh, working in, in this uh, research area. So this is, so if someone asks you what's the difference between them, you could say that you no know, artificial intelligence is the broader field. Machine learning is just a subset of you know, the brains behind creating the artificial intelligent agent. So let's say if someday we have to create uh, you no know, artificial intelligence, or I mean, we are doing that today as well, but like a true artificial intelligence, if we uh, reach to that point where now it can do all sorts of things, right? From imagination, dreaming, memory, those kind of things, right? So if we are talking about true artificial intelligence, then machine learning will be the brain behind it, right? So other fields like computer vision, path planning, all those will also make up uh, you know, our other components of creating AI. Okay, so machine learning is the brain of it. And then these are subset of machine learning algorithms which rely on neural networks. And these algorithms are called deep, deep learning algorithms or deep neural networks. Okay, is everyone with me on this one? And Dinesh, I'll get to uh, machine learning more in just on the next slide. But does everyone understand the hierarchy of these terms? All right, great. And guys, let's make sure that if you have any questions, please throw it. No, no question. If you think it's silly, don't, don't worry about it. Okay. It's a small group over here. Uh, everyone is part of our community and it's it, no question is silly. Just ask them if I'm not able to get on it right now, I'll get to it after the session or no, you can even stay back. I'll be over here after the session as well. All right, so let me show you some things that you can build using uh, machine learning. So these are some of the projects that we build in our class when we, uh, in our long-term machine learning programs, these are some of the projects that we built. I won't talk about 
lot about it and i'll just let you enjoy our projects It's a pretty cool, right? So over here, as you saw, I was writing a few things on the blackboard over here in the sublime text window over here. And over here, we are getting some you no know, digits that we are recognizing. And there are some errors that we got. So it was not 100% accurate. And there are a lot of ways to fool this algorithm as well. But what you saw over there is a classic problem in machine learning, which is recognizing these handwritten digits. So think about if you do it using you no know, if else statements or uh, it's not even feasible right there are so many variations of this letter 3 you can't just read a pixel you could have you no know, these uh, numbers which are written small there could be some shift there could be some rotation right so only if an algorithm is actually able to identify the concept of 3 just like you do inside your brain then only you will be able to uh, predicted properly right for most of the times so this is the first project uh, that i wanted to share with you guys this is another project which is called which we call it as our crawling robot uh, project which is which uses reinforcement learning which is another one of the breakthroughs that we have seen in machine learning in recent fields what we do in this class is teach this robot how to crawl in this environment so in this project what we do is teach this robot this robot will try out some random actions at first and then eventually it will learn by itself without us explicitly programming how to move forward in this environment because let's say if tomorrow there are some obstacles which are placed over here right so the robot will be still able to adapt and move forward in that environment and you know, overcome those obstacles as well let me just play this video for you Pretty cool, right? Uh, in that video, we are you know, able to uh, teach that robot how to move forward. So let's come to what machine learning is all about. As I said, I don't want to give you a Wikipedia definition of you know, if you learn from your experience or past data, uh, that's what constitutes a machine learning algorithm. You guys know that you, you, are, feel, you are free to read that online on other blogs. What I want to do is you now give you a mathematical intuition behind what machine learning is from what you already know in your high school. So in our high school class, we were given a bunch of data points. These data points could be a set of numbers. Let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, so on. Okay. 
and we were also given a function. So let's say we are given f of x is x square. So how will the output of this function look like? It will look like something like this. Does everyone agree with me on this one? If f of x was x square and if we are given a series like this minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, so on, the output of this function will look something like this. Does everyone agree with me on that? Yep. If the input was minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, f of x was x square, we'll get a graph something like a parabola over here. Right, and this is what we used to do in our high school class. But what is new with machine learning is that now we are given this input data and we are also given this output function, the expected results. And our job as a machine learning engineer is to come up with this mapping function f of x. Okay, so let's say you were you are a machine learning engineer and someone gave you this as input minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one zero one two three four this is your input and someone tells you that this is the expected output so you as a machine learning engineer what will you tell them what is the model or what is the mapping function what will you tell them what is the model or what is the mapping function if this is the input minus four minus three minus two one zero one two three four and this is the expected output this parabola what will you tell them what is f of x Yeah, we just saw that that f of x will be x square if this is the input and this is the expected output f of x the model of this world or the mapping function is going to be x square. So when they say that I am doing machine learning, what are they actually trying to learn? It's not something hypothetical inside your computer. They are trying to learn this function f of x. This is what machine learning is all about and specifically supervised machine learning is all about. And if you get this concept, you got most of the basics of machine learning right over there. Is everyone getting me? So someone had asked me, you know, can you explain what machine learning is in simple terms? This is what machine learning is all about. You are given some inputs and you are also given the expected output. And our job as machine learning engineer is to come up with what could have resulted in this output. So we are, in, we are, interested in building this model of the world or the mapping function. We are trying to come up with this function. Is everyone getting me? Are there any questions? Okay. So let's, let's do some exercise and so Ashutosh says, does it mean you are just interested in visualizing the output? So not necessarily. A lot of times we are not able to visualize the output. In two dimensions, you can visualize it. But if there are more than two, two or three dimensions, it becomes very difficult for us to visualize. Irrespective of what you could visualize or not, the concept remains the same. Okay, that doesn't change the underlying math behind it. Okay, does that make sense? Irrespective of you being able to visualize it or not, the mathematics doesn't change behind it. The vector calculus doesn't change. So let's do some examples so that it will be much more clear. So let's do some mathematical foundations for the model that we are going to build in our class today. So over here, we have a line which is drawn on the on a graph. You have x over here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You have y axis and you are given a line. Okay, and I want to ask you, I already showed that answer to you, but uh, again, let me ask you, if you are, um, um, no, if you want to represent this line mathematically, how would you represent this? Like, how would you represent this line mathematically? So what is the general equation of any line? Yeah, it's y is mx plus b or mx plus c, whatever you want to call it, right? So the general equation of the line is y is equals to mx plus b, where m is the slope of this line, right? And b 
or C, uh, what the, whatever you want to call it, is the point where it cuts the y-axis. It is the y-intercept. Okay. Now, can you think? Can you tell me what is the equation of this line? So I want you to find what is the value of m and b for me. So your third says is y is x plus one. So you think that the slope of this line is one. Any other answers, guys? Shubham says the slope of this line is 0.5. Prashant and Anurag are getting that as well. So guys, look over here. Another way to look at the slope is you could also think of the slope as the amount by which this line is rising on Y axis. Okay. For every one block that you move on the X axis. So how much are we going up for every one block that we move towards the right? So I'm giving this as a hint for those who were not able to get it. I know that a lot of you have got it right. So think over here, look over here. How much are we going up for every one block that we moved on X axis? So over here, we moved one block from two to three. How much did we go up? Half a block, 0.5, right? Not one. So the slope of this line is 0.5. Okay, so we are going up by just half a block for every one block that we move on the right. So slope of this line is 0.5, and a lot of you got this right that the point where we are cutting the y-axis is obviously one over here. So the equation of this line will be y is 0.5x plus one. Okay. All right. So let's do one more so that it is more clear. So my question to you is find the value of y for x equals to 20 on this line just to make things a little easier. So we'll do the same thing. Y is mx plus b. This is the general equation. And then I'll just have this for you as well. Now tell me what is the value of y for x equals to 20. And give me the final answer. What is the value of y for x equals to 20? Yeah, a lot of you are getting that right. A lot of you have told me that y is equal to 2x is the equation because the point where we are cutting the y axis, the y intercept is obviously zero and the m over here, the m is two because for every one block that we moved, we went up by two blocks. Right, so y is equals to 2 and b is 0. So y is equal to 2x is the equation of this line. If you put the value of x is 20 in this equation, you get y equals to 40. As simple as that, right? So now you will tell me, Meer, why are you teaching me high school math again? Okay, but this happens to be one of the important concepts when we build our first machine learning model today, which is called as a linear regression. So over here, an example of a linear regression problem is, let's say, if you want to predict the score of a student based on the number of hours that they study. So over here on x-axis, we have the hours a student studies for an exam. And over here on the y-axis is the score that they get on a particular exam. So from the past, we know that students who have studied these many hours have got this much of score. So if you study this much, you get this many score. Uh, in your exam. So this is the past data which is available. So what we as machine learning engineers do is create a model. So we look at this data and say that, you know what, this is what the trend looks like. So we draw a line which is closest to all these points. And we say that this is how the trend looks like. I'll draw a line which is closest to all these points. So now can you tell me how will you represent this straight line in a computer's memory or how, how many coefficients, let me be more precise over here. How many coefficients do you need to represent this line? And which are those two coefficients?
So Yathat says to Shantanu, Anurag, say M and C. Kiran got it too as well. So yes, all of you are right over there. We need two coefficient and those two coefficients are the slope and the y-intercept, right? Because if someone gives you these two points, you know how that line looks like. You can visualize that line, right? And in two dimensional setting over here, it's a line, but let's say in two dimensions, it's a line. Then in three dimensions, it will be a So guys, for people who are not getting it, in two dimensions, if you have a line, in three dimensions, you will have a, a plane, right? Just like if you have a, in two dimensions, it's a triangle, in three dimensions, it's a, a pyramid, right? Or it's a cone. Just like over here, you have something, in two dimensions, you have a line, in three dimensions, we have a plane. Uh, and again, there will be some parameters of that plane, right? And if you if you are a machine learning engineer you want to make things more fancy when you go in more than three dimensions you call that something as a hyperplane so you are talking about hyperplane now right the concepts everything the uh, you know, those things remain the same again you just extend that concept to two dimensions three dimensions and so on but what you are actually trying to find out is these two things the slope and the Y intercept. So if there is a friend of yours who is telling that I'm doing linear regression or I built a machine learning model, uh, tell them that I know that you're not doing something fancy. All you're trying to come up as these two parameters of those lines, right? So if it is a two dimensional and a simple problem, right? They are trying to come up with uh, no, just two parameters. If they have more than two dimensions or they're dealing with more than two factors over there, it will be more parameters, but again, the concept remain the same. It's just extending the same concept to more parameters. Is everyone with me? So if someone says that I'm solving a linear regression problem and what is linear regression over here? The, the linear word comes from the assumption that we make an assumption that everything in this world has a linear relationship. Okay. So if you look over here, these points not necessarily have a perfect linear relationship. Right, so you could actually come up with a complex model, which is a little bit curvy over here, right? So you could have something with a, a mapping function, f of x, which has some curves over here. But the concept remains the same. And with linear regression, we are saying that let's assume, let's make a naive assumption that everything in this world can be represented using a linear relation and a straight line. And that is what we do. So if someone says that I'm doing a linear relation, what are they actually trying to find? The parameters of the parameters of this line, the, this regression line. And we know what these two parameters are, right? If you have these two parameters, you have solved this problem. Is everyone with me? So guys, this is how we approach you know, most of our problems over here at Code Heroku. We try to connect it with what the things that you already know. So when people talk to me and say that, hey, uh, no, I, how, many, how much of math do I need to know for machine learning? I try to tell them that, you know what, you already know these things. It's just that you no know, machine learning engineers try to make, uh, you no, know, in our field, we make it more fancy. That's it. And my job is to make that fancy a little, uh, no, little bit, uh, I would say, uh, childlike and no, present it to you in a way that no, it's, it's easy for you to understand. So we know that y is mx plus b is the equation of the line. And if we know the m and the b, we can draw this line. Okay. So let's say if someone tells you that you want to make a prediction for this student who has studied 10 hours. Right. So if the student has studied 10 hours, you as a machine learning engineer, what will you tell them? What is the, what will be their expected score? Yeah, because we just saw that in our example before as well. 
if you if you know the equation of this line once you have the equation if you plug the value of x getting the value of y is as trivial as just putting that value in that equation right so you can just say for x equals to 10 y will be 60 over here so our prediction for 10 hours of study it will be 60 so congratulations you just built or no you did your first model in your head right now and i'm not saying that this is done and we are going home now we'll do it in python as well so but yeah this is what it is to you know uh, building a machine learning a simple machine learning model you can obviously have more complicated models but this is the first model that anyone who is studying machine learning generally they would you know try to build so let's say we actually the student actually goes and they study 10 marks and he goes to exam he or she goes to the exam and then they got more marks so what will happen is we we as a machine learning engineer what we do is say that okay i see that you have got more marks now i'll take this as a learning for my future reference and i'll try to improve my model based on it but this difference between the actual value this blue point and my prediction over here this we term as the error in our prediction right so this actual value minus my predicted value will be the error in my prediction so to evaluate the model should we have less error or should we do we want more error should we try to build a model with less error or more error yeah obviously so we want this difference between our predictions and our actual values to be as less as possible right so what we try to do is also separate out when we are actually building this model itself to evaluate our models we what we do is separate out some of these points as training points and test data points so what we say is we'll evaluate our model using these test data points so let's say we have this blue as a test point what we do is then use this blue point to evaluate how much error do we have and a rule of thumb is to use 80% of your data as your training data points and 20% the remaining 20% will use as our testing points to evaluate how we are performing okay is everyone with me on this one do we have any questions So again, Razim, it's no hard and fast rule. It's just a rule of thumb. You can try out with different things, but in general, you want to utilize maximum data that you have for training purposes. But you want to leave out something for your testing as well. Okay. So if you, some people prefer eighty-five, fifteen, uh, but more the training data you will take, there are chances that you will overfit. your problem so i don't want to go into too much of technicalities over there but there are some trade offs over there okay yeah so the way you sample them is to make sure that you get uh, you no know, from all the classes or you no know, you are uh, equal it's uh, the distribution is even you want to make sure that you know that 20 you you want to sample it randomly uh, and distribute your training and test data points as close to random as possible okay you want to make sure that you sample all your points over there in the 20 as well does that make sense okay all right all right all right guys so let's go into our hands on part for today i want you guys to go to this site over here which is notebooks.azure.com where we'll be doing our hands on exercise so uh we'll be using this as our uh, no a jupiter notebook if some of you have no used a jupiter notebook before if you already have it on your system feel free to use it on locally on your system for those who don't have a lot of packages and python installed this is an online tool which will help you do that without installing anything locally so i'm just pasting this link for you guys so go over here notebooks.azure.com and once you are over here click on the top right click over here sign in
and if you have a microsoft account or a skype or a you uh, know live account right so all those email ids which are in microsoft ecosystem you should be able to sign in using those things if you don't have one you could also say create one over here it will be pretty quick or if you uh, now if you remember it you can sign in over here so i'll be waiting over here uh, guys tell me once you are able to sign in to your microsoft account over here if you say create one you might have to give your gmail id so you could say create one and you could give your gmail account so give your gmail id over here so you could say create one and then give your gmail or your phone number and then they'll send you a verification code over there okay so i'm waiting over here for you guys to create one account i already have one over here so i'll be logging in using that but go to this link click on sign in and tell me on the chat box once you are done once you have signed in successfully using your microsoft account all right kiran if you have it please go ahead and sign in and let me know in the chat box once you have signed in just say done over there yes sagar if you want to use another ide uh if you have those uh, things uh, installed on your computer if you have scikit learn matplotlib and those libraries installed you could do that but if you want to follow with me on this one you could uh, do it using an azure notebook over here it is fun so you'll learn something new if you haven't tried it yes rajiv you can use anaconda as well you can open a local copy of jupiter notebook on your anaconda and for others who are you now hearing all these new uh, technology names if you are not from uh, data science machine learning or you are not from python uh, i would say no you are not a python developer you haven't worked with don't worry about it okay All right, I'm seeing a lot of done. I'll wait over here for few more seconds so that we don't leave anyone behind. That's a very uh, that's something which is very important to me. That there are some people who are really smart and you know they are always ahead, uh, but I want to make sure that I don't leave anyone behind. Uh, and no one from here should go away thinking that I couldn't keep up with the pace of the class. All right, so I am seeing a lot of duns over there. So let me go ahead and sign in as well. All right, so you should see something like this over here. and if you don't have any other projects created you should see uh, create one project uh, listed over there so if you don't have any projects let me just is there a way to delete this one uh, not sure but anyways so if you don't have any project you should see a link over there which say create a project so click on that so create a new project click on that create a new project if you already have something like what i do you should see this page over here right so you should see something like this when you say create a project if you are not seeing it do what i did over here is i went to this my projects over here and then i said new project so i want to create a new project okay so i'm going to say linear regression ml okay and i'm going to make it a public project because there is nothing secret over here so i'm going to say linear regression ml create create a new project and once you are over here tell me on the chat box let's say you created a project and you are done okay so for those who did not get it we went to my projects which is the link available over here my projects over here and you could say new project 
create a name you can make it public and then say create one so i'm in over here linear regression ml my resume is done i'm waiting for the folks to complete the creation of project okay so some of you are getting done uh, still waiting for the folks for other people who are done you could click over here and say notebook so add go to the plus sign over here you want to add a new notebook over here so over here let's say linear regression again okay so new notebook name linear regression and let's say python 3.6 okay and say click new so once you click on the new a new jupyter notebook will open up for you i am waiting over here for other folks so guys who are not done yet let me know if you are getting stuck somewhere you want to create a new project and once you created a new project you want to go to this plus sign over here say notebook give the name of your notebook i'm calling it linear regression select python 3.6 and then hit the new button okay so once you are done let me know in the chat box so this new notebook was created click on this notebook all right so i had a question over there which said uh, how is the ipython notebook extension different from the dot py so i just expanded on the notation over there which is i py nd which is i python notebook right so it's an interactive python notebook uh, so just like you have an interactive python shell the one that you use from command line uh, this notebook is a web based notebook that uses python interpreter on the back okay so it uses a python interpreter behind the scenes but it gives you an interactive environment right so you could do things like you no know, add a markdown uh, you no know, syntax over here so you could say something like this is my first notebook right and if you hit a run over here okay so my bad this is notebook over here so you want to say select markdown and then say this is a notebook right so you could add things like these over here for some reason this markdown is not getting executed and i'm trying to figure that out is there a space oh okay okay so thanks for that <laughs> razi uh, uh, so you could add you no know, more interactivity you could add pictures and those kind of things so it's much more easier if you're trying to present uh, these things to someone else so let me make sure that i help you create the new project over here so you can click on my projects and once you click on my project you could say new project and give the project name and you could say create once you are inside that project so i am over your linear regression ml once you are inside this project you should say the add sign over here click on notebook and create the notebook name with python 3.6 as the extension okay and then 
once you are there click on linear regression ipython notebook and this should take you over here okay all right so is everyone over here does everyone have their jupyter notebook open So I'm seeing a few yeses. All right, so the next thing that we want to do is I want you to get some import statements from a link. So what I want to do is give this link to you. So go to this link. So this is a starter notebook that I have created for you guys. So go to this link and then click on the starter notebook. So click on the starter dot Python notebook. So in this notebook, I have a bunch of import statements for you over here and the data set file. So remember the data set that we just saw about the student scores, the number of hours that they studied and know the marks that they get. So this is the data set that I have for you. So what I want you to do is copy this thing inside your notebook now. Okay. So again, here's how I did. I went to this link that I just gave you on the chat and then click on the starter.ipython notebook. This will take you to this cell over here. So I want to copy all this and paste it inside my linear regression notebook. Okay. So go over here and paste it and then say run. So this will import all our necessary libraries and download our data set. Again, this is no rocket science that I'm doing over here. You might be thinking why am I copy pasting, but hey, it's just time uh, saving over here that we are trying to import all our libraries. And you just uh, you know, downloading our data set, which is which will call student underscore dot CSV and will import will download it to our uh, folder that we are working in. Okay. So you can safely ignore this error. Uh, it's not much a big deal. Okay, so seems like I have downloaded my data set now over here. So if you look in this folder where you were working in right now, we did not have anything over here. So if you refresh this now, you would see that now I have the student underscore score dot CSV file, which is now downloaded on our, uh, the same folder where I was working in. Okay. So do this and let me know once you are done. You can run this cell by clicking run over here, or you could say shift enter. You could say shift enter or just hit run over here. Okay. So guys, are you, are you getting what I'm doing over here? What I did is uh, we are importing a bunch of packages that we'll be using in our class and we are sending a curl request to the CSV file and downloading this CSV file in the same folder that we are working in. Okay. Nothing fancy over here. Just a simple import statement. Let me know in the chat box once you are done. So I'll wait another few seconds until I hear some more done. So I've got four people who have responded that they are at this point. I want to know from the rest 24 people who are 
with us on this live session what's happening guys if there is any some if there is something where you are stuck please bring it out let me know in the chat box i might be able to guide you okay great so a lot of you are getting done now uh, so what next we need to do is now actually read this csv file in our python program right so we want to read this csv file so what we will do is use the pandas library or the package over here to read the csv file into our python programs so if you are someone who has not worked with pandas before i want you to go ahead look on google and tell me which method from pandas will you use to read a csv file in a python program okay so this is the philosophy that we use in all our classes as well there is no spoon feeding as such so this these sessions are not there for me to tell you something and then you just copy and paste those things on your system i want to teach you how to fish rather than giving you that fish so what i'm telling you is my hint to you is use this pandas library and tell me how will you read a csv file in a python program go ahead use google that's your best friend find out right over there pandas reading a csv file and how do you read that csv file in a python program which method will you use and again if you already know this you've done this before let other people who are new let them answer it so go over here say pandas read csv file in python right so looks like there is this documentation from pandas over here rather than going to some other stack overflow or those kind of things i'm going to go to the documentation page right and you see that pandas has a method read underscore csv over here and these are all the parameters that it takes the first parameter over here is the file path right so the the path of that file and for us the path is we are in the same folder the csv file is in the same folder right so we do not need to give explicit path there is also an example that they have given us pd dot read underscore csv data dot csv file right so we'll just use this thing so let's come over here let's say df now what is df ds df stands for data frame and it is the type of the object that pandas returns when we do that so i am calling my variable as df as well so i am going to say data frame is equal to pd now where is this pd coming from because i am importing my pandas and giving that as an alias of pd right so i am giving it a shorthand so that i don't have to repeat pandas word every time in my program so i'm going to say pd dot read underscore csv i hope you guys are able to view this properly okay so pd dot read underscore csv now the name of our file is student underscore scores dot csv so let me just paste it over here so i don't make any typos right so we have df is pd dot read underscore csv we gave our csv file name okay and now let's just go ahead and run this if this works without any errors so it seems like it's working without any errors so let's just again print it out as well so if you want to just print out something you can either say print or you could also use the this the name of the variable over here and it will print that out right so we have printed our data frame over here as you see we have all our we have two columns over here the hours a student studies and the score of that student and our job as machine learning engineer will be to build a model such that if someone gives us a new student with how many hours that they studied we will be able to predict their score on that exam okay everyone with me until here try it out and tell me if you have reached over here
Yes, Kiran, if you use print, that is okay as well. So you could do something like print. Right, so this works as well. But I am noticing that you could, you are losing that formatting over there, right? So this might be something which is specific to Jupyter Notebook that now oh, here you're getting a nice formatted HTML table instead of just that print, which is giving you a string over there, right? Right, so uh, the other thing is, let's say in this case, our table was small enough. We just had 25 rows over here, right? But what if our table is too long? Like if we have like 1 million rows, will we print the entire CSV file on our uh, terminal over here or on our screens? Is it feasible? No, right? So what we should do is rather if you want to just print out first few rows of this data frame, so you could also say data frame dot head over here now this will just give you the first few rows of your data frame okay all right so now we have seen what our data frame looks like we have the hours and the scores now let's separate out these columns so that we can actually uh, you know do machine learning on top of it right so we'll separate out our columns first now so let's say on x axis so in X axis, we need to have the dependent variable and that's the general rule of thumb that you use that on X axis, you take the dependent independent variable on Y axis, you take the dependent variable. So over here, what should we take on X axis and what should we take on Y axis? We want to use independent variable on X axis. What should we use over here? So guys, make sure that the way this notebook works is now all the cells are executed from top to better bottom, but only one at a time. So if you are getting not defined error, that means your first cell, some of the cells before it are not executed, right? So make sure that you click run on the first cell. This will all import everything. And then you do the run on the second cell. Okay. All right, so over here, a lot of you told me that X, you'll take it as the hours, the student studies, right? Because this is the independent, the score depends on uh, the hours. That is why it is on the Y axis, okay? So what we'll do is we want to say X equals to data frame of, we'll take X over here, hours, and Y will take as data frame of scores. Right, so we separated our X and Y. So let's just make sure that this runs without any errors. Okay, this is good. Now let's separate out our training and test data points. Okay, so to separate out our training and test data points, how many points should we use for training? Over here we have 25 points, right? So if you do this as well, right? So when we did this, we know that there are 0 to 24. So there are 25 points. So how many points should we take for training and how many points for testing? So the rule of thumb was 80 to 20. So 80 for 80 percentage, 80 percent of 25. What will that give us? So what will be the value of how many number of training data points and how many testing? So Yathad says 20 and the rest five for testing. Does everyone agree with him on that? And if you want to split 80, 20, this data set will take 20 points as our training and remaining five as our testing points. Does everyone agree with him on that one? Guys, let me know what are you facing. Uh, some of you, I think that you're facing some errors. 
so again i would say the same thing make sure that you are re, uh, running the entire thing because this curl request will download that file for you so what you should do is if you are not getting some errors try running this as well so this will do a restart and run all the cells okay so this will run make sure that everything is running i am waiting for you guys to tell me if this is correct that to split our data into training points and test data points will we should use yathard says we should use 20 points is he correct So Shubham, you are getting it the other way. Uh, if we use just five points for training, you are not utilizing your data enough, right? Machine learning is all about you know having more data, not less data. If you train your machine learning models properly with enough examples, then only you will get better results, right? So there is no point in having twenty points for testing and just five points for training. Just just. Uh, no think of it like you no know, if there is a kid who is going for an exam you want to teach them properly before they go to the exam right if you just if they only practice on few examples just if they practice only on five examples and in their exam they are going to get 20 questions they might not perform well but let's say if they practice 20 questions and they only appear in the test for five questions they might do much better right does that make sense okay and for others who are saying 70 30 40 60 guys we have only 25 points over here look over here we have only 25 rows 0 through 24 so 25 rows now what i told you is we'll use the rule of thumb which is 80 20 80% for training and 20% for testing so what is 80% of 25 Yeah, Anurag got it right. Twenty for training and five for test. Okay, so let's split this data set up that way. So I'm gonna say x train comma y train is equal to x of zero through twenty, just like you do array indexing, right? That's uh, that's how you would do it in pandas over here as well. So I'm just indexing my, into my array. I'm saying x comma y is now y of Zero to twenty as well, and x test comma y test is equal to x of twenty is to everything. Like if you don't mention anything over here, it will just go until the end. Okay, and then you could say y of twenty to the end over here. Okay. So let me know once you have reached over here. You should run the cell. So Anurag says, "Where are we getting the number of rows from?" So over here, Anurag, as you are seeing in this CSV file, this is the data that we have been given to us. Okay, so we don't have any control over how much data do we have. If we have more data, then we'll do more. Over here, we have only twenty-five rows. We have only twenty-five data points. That's why we we are getting twenty percent or eighty percent of that twenty-five.
so we don't have that much of points kartik over here again i guess i'm like explaining this concept really bad um is there a way i could do something better over here uh, let me make sure that you guys get this concept properly so let me try this i'll be really bad at my drawing over here so this is all our data okay so we have all our data points from 1 2 3 4 and really sorry for that i don't even have a mouse i'm just doing it on my uh keyboard over here so uh if you have 20 points right and i want to split this entire data set into two parts the first part is 80% right because i want to train my data well i want to my kid to learn and practice properly before he goes to an exam right so i have 80% over here and i have another 20% over here right so how many points will i have of this entire if i have 20 total points or in our example we have 25 so if i have 25 total points and i want 80% for my training how much is that what should i have over here how many points should i have 20 right uh, so someone is saying that no that's not my question my question is how to determine the amount of rows for training and testing when we want to split the data containing a million of rows so it doesn't matter how how much of that uh, number is okay if you go with this rule of thumb of 80 20 irrespective of uh, the number of rows you will get a reasonable performance okay so if it's a million rows go with 80000 20000 or no whatever that is 8 8 lakhs 2 lakhs yes a cycle learn uh, which you we just saw we'll we'll see in a few minutes uh, we'll be using a package called cycle learn and it allows you to do split that uh, data using a method as well right so it could do that using a method as well but i want to keep it simple and that's why we are doing this and someone is saying that kartik actually wanted to know where are we getting this 20 from so this 20 is again we said that 80% of that 25 will be 20 points so the first 20 points is 0 to 20 because it will give us 0 to 19 and then over here you say 20 to whatever is there till the end so 20 to 25 will get over here is everyone clear on this and again guys there is no harm in asking if it is not clear i'll try to explain it once again it must be that i'm not trying i'm not explaining properly that is why you did not get it in the first time okay okay everyone is over here and let's run this make sure that this is running we have split this properly okay so now let's do some machine learning for the first time in our class this class <laughs> so we'll use scikit learn it's another package another good great package which allows us to build these models machine learning models with ease so over here i'm importing a package from scikit learn which is called linear regression so what this does is it doesn't i don't have to write rewrite the model from scratch So I could use something like Scikit-Learn to build a model and then use my data on top of it. So what I'm going to do over here is say model is equal to we'll use linear regression model that we imported on the top over there. So I'm going to say model is equal to linear regression. Now this created a bare bones linear regression model for me. Okay. So if we run this, we will we executed it, but we just instantiated an object we haven't done anything really with it so i want you to go to the scikit learn's documentation go on google find out go to the documentation of scikit learn let me do that for you so i'll come over here so we don't need this anymore i'm not sure if we need this as well okay so let's come over here and say scikit learn linear regression okay now this is the first uh thing that pops up so 
try to look for this link sklearn dot linear models now, this is the documentation for scikit learn's linear regression model and there are some parameters attributes and some examples given over here so i want you to find out how will you apply your data the data that we just created in our training the x train and y train how will you apply it to this model how will you put it inside this model how will you apply it can you tell me which method from scikit learn look at the documentation over here there are some methods which method will you use to apply and there is some examples over here as well can you tell me which method will you use to apply your data So Razim Kiran says fit. So why don't you go ahead and try it out? See if it works. Other folks, look at the example over here. Look at the methods over here. We want to use the training data that we just got, and we want to apply it to our model. The model that we created is just a model object. It's a bare bones model. We haven't applied any data to it. So, Karthik, not get params because the get parameters is just getting some parameters of this particular model. We haven't given our training examples to this model yet. So, how do you give that to it? there are some examples over here as well to make it even more easier look in this two lines what do you see so can you guys see this example over here? They are using the fit method. Right? So if you use the fit, we can pass our, through this fit method, we can pass our X and the Y. Right? So it is the fit method that we need to use. So let's go ahead and use our fit method over here. So we could say dot fit. And I want to give my X and the Y. Which should I, what should I give? Should I give X train, Y train or X test, Y test? What should I do to train my model? Should I give X train Y train or X test Y test? Yeah, training set. So which are the two variables which has our training set? Yeah, X train and Y train, right? So we should say X train comma Y train. Okay, now let's see if this works. And we are getting some error, right? And believe me or not, it was planted by me over there. And can you think about what is going wrong? A lot of times when you see error, you just blank out and then start something on searching online rather than reading the error itself. So that is something that I tell a lot of our students. If you see an error, don't panic. First, read that error prompt properly. So what do you read over here? What is your error prompt telling you to do? So what is our error from telling us to do? Yeah, it wants a 2D array and we have passed a 1D array. That is true. And what is the solution that the error prompt is telling us that what can we do to uh, avoid that? 
how can we overcome that yeah it is asking us to use a reshape so let's see it is telling us two things that you could either use array dot reshape if your data has a single feature or array dot reshape one comma minus one if we have a single sample so how many samples do we have how many data points do we have So how many data points do we have total 25 right Rajin we have 25 points yeah so we definitely don't have a single sample over here does everyone agree with me on this one but do we have a single feature is there only one parameter that we are predicting our scores on so do we have only just one parameter in the x over here is that true yes we have only one parameter based on which we are making predictions and that is why we are getting over this error over here so we need to use this array dot reshape minus one comma one let me just show you where you will use it so let me just copy it over here minus one comma one and we should apply it right at the top wherein after we have done this so where we are getting the x and the y first we'll convert it to numpy array because this method is applied to a numpy array and not a data frame it is like matching your apples and oranges right so these are different formats so i want to make sure that i'm working with apples and not oranges so i did value over there okay so values not value so you could say values dot reshape minus one comma one and just run everything after that so what you could say is just say rerun the entire restart and run all the cells so i want to rerun everything so you would see that you no know, it will start from the top and it should reach over here Yep. So now I'm not getting any errors. Let me know once you have reached to this point. So over here, minus one comma one, we say that minus one we use when we don't know the actual dimensions of what we are reshaping it to. And one, we are saying that we have a single feature over there. So reshape it over there. So we just, uh, what this thing is doing is just converting your single dimensional array to, to a two dimensional array okay so right now you have something like this your x is over here so you have something like two over here so you're converting that to something like this so you're converting this to two comma uh, double brackets over here okay So Sandanu, uh, it is a little bit more tricky. So what I could do is you know, send you the reference of the minus one comma one after we are done with this class. 
so it is not that no i'll just be able to give you an example a lot of it also has to do with the way the numpy method functions internally right so it's like you no know, they have coded it that way that you no know, if you don't know the dimensions use minus 1 over here and if you have a single feature use one okay so there is no not much logic to it rather than saying that you know what this is how the reshaping for one dimension to two dimensions work and i can give you some references as well which uh, you know extensively explain this you now why did they do it this way all right so now that we have our model build now a good part is that we have applied our training and now our model is ready now let's just go ahead and make predictions so we'll say y predictions now i want to predict on the y right because you're trying to predict the scores so y predictions is equal to model and we'll use the predict method uh, obvious right so model dot predict and what should i give over here uh i want to make the predictions based on my test points or my training points should i use my test points or training points yeah test points right because there is no point in testing on what you are already trained if a kid is going to an exam you want to test him on questions that he hasn't uh, no we haven't given them in the homework or no we have haven't done in the class itself so we'll say test points and we'll give our x test to it because we are making predictions based on the x right so we did model dot predict x test now this will give us the y predictions now let's just go ahead and plot it on the graph and see how they uh, now look like so what we'll do is uh, we already have imported matplotlib over here this is a popular python package which is used for plotting graphs charts and plots uh, different kind of plots so we'll use this library over here and it it is no complicated all you could do is just say plot dot plot now what again it's we are using an alias just like we are doing for pd now we could say plot dot plot now the way this works is you give the x axis value the y axis value i'm going to say on x axis i want my x test right uh, and my y axis i want the predictions that i made so just just what we did right now so i want my y predictions and i want to have this as a dot right so if i want to have this as a dot i would say uh, do a dot over here rather than drawing a line so i want this as holes or no uh, blue dots over here so let's see what do i get and we got our predictions these are the predictions that we made for our points but we also need to plot what are the actual results were right because then we will know what if we are accurate or not so let's also plot so we could say plot dot plot x test and where are the actual answers which variable has the actual answers for the x test so if i'm if my predicted values are in y prediction the actual answers the correct answers for x test are in yeah y test y test has my correct answers so look over here as well so this was our training data we split it into two parts this all everything until 20 was all this was until 20 was our training points and this all this is testing points this is x test this is y test based on 4.8 we made some predictions in y predict right now my actual answer is in this variable over here which is y test right so this thing over here should be x test underscore y test 
and let's plot the dot of a different color this time so let's say ro which will give me a red colored dot now let's see what do we get and we are getting all my points over here as you see our predictions are quite close to the actual answers our predictions are in blue and the actual answers are in red right so as we see uh, sometimes we have a lot of error but in lot of other cases our error is reasonably small are you guys getting this let me make sure that you are able to see the code over here so ashutosh can you uh, make sure that you are spelling these things properly so x we haven't defined anywhere right so x is not there anywhere so make sure you don't have any space over here make sure it is x underscore test by prediction if you are following me or if you have any different name of va uh, variables just make sure if you want to make sure that if everything is correct and there is still some errors you should do this restart the kernel and run all the cells and wait for 2 3 seconds so because it will take some time so that will run your script from top to bottom okay all right guys so there is one last thing that i want to do over here we have made our predictions and see what our actual values was as well now i want to actually quantify this error uh, there is some error we know that but how much is the error can we quantify it i am using a package over here from scikit learn i am importing it somewhere over here can you tell me which method will i use to get the error like to quantify the error which method should i use yeah mean squared error right so if i use this mean squared error i'll get the quantified version of rather than just visually seeing it we want a, a number so i'm going to say mean squared error let me make sure this is the one yeah it is correct mean squared error and the format of this thing is you give the actual value and you give the predicted value so which are the two variable names which has the first one where where do we have our actual values stored and which variable stores our predicted value our actual values are in y test does everyone agree this is y test and our predicted values are in which variable has our predicted value y predictions yes all of you are getting that y prediction has our predicted values right so let's see how much is the error our error is 41.22 units right so whatever the score is in uh, that's our mean squared error and not necessarily uh, now we should it depends upon now what the scale of our score is right so if our score is between 0 to 100 something like 41 so we can't really say if this is a good mean squared error or a bad one if our score is from only from 0 to 10 then for, uh, something like 41 might be bad right so it's not normalized if we our score is from 0 to 10000 then maybe a mean squared error of 41 should be good enough so you can only use mean squared error and uh, these error numbers 
to compare one model to another model but you can't you know compare it across different kind of problems so mean squared error of 41 we don't really know we can't really say if it is a good or bad but if we create another machine learning model and then compare it then we can say if this model is better or model the second model is better does everyone is everyone getting that okay so seems like you no know, we were able to you know build a real machine learning model and i hope you guys enjoyed building it what i want to do next is make sure that you guys understand some uh, concepts about our program that we have at code heroku as well you might have seen today that you no know, this is what our most of our students tell us as well that you don't really need prerequisite to grasp the contents in our courses because what we do is you no know, we actually introduce those prerequisites to you in the class itself and that's why a lot of our students tell that you don't really need to learn a lot of things before you come to a class at code repo because we make sure that whenever you come to any class we explain those concepts just like we did over here uh, when we are doing linear regression so we have three programs over here the machine learning foundation the machine learning launchpad and machine learning professional the machine learning foundation is for students the machine learning uh, professional course is for working professionals who want to switch their career into machine learning over here all these courses are online in machine learning foundation course we start from the basics of python data analysis and you now we build our machine learning model just like we did today but we'll explore it in more depth and we do lot many uh, algorithms as well and then in the foundations course you have all the in the launchpad course you have all the foundations classes plus the mathematical uh, foundations which are required for machine learning so that is covered extensively in the launchpad class and in the machine learning professional course you cover all the state of the art algorithms such as deep learning and reinforcement learning because when you go to an interview if you are if you want to switch to machine learning they'll ask you these questions about deep learning and reinforcement learning just like we saw the crawling robot was an example of reinforcement learning right and the state of the art in machine learning today is deep learning using neural networks all these programs are 6 months online programs uh here's a detailed syllabus as well for those who might be interested we start off with the statistical the foundation stone to machine learning program is statistics so we start off with that and we explore all these packages that we kind of studied some of these today in much more depth we start off with that and then move on to the extraction and cleaning part because 80% of what it data scientists do is you no know, they try to gather the data extract it and clean it so we you no know, we teach you how to work with sql no sql databases in python how to make api calls all those kind of things uh, we also then go over the exploratory data analysis concepts in python we use jupyter notebooks and again pandas for a lot of those things then we move into supervised machine learning chapter wherein we go over all the supervised machine learning algorithms which are very popular these days and you work on some projects just like you no know, uh, you no know, building a email spam classification program or if it is if a human cell has been infected with disease like malaria or not and right? so there's a lot of computer vision aspects that come in over here as well then we move on to reinforcement learning wherein you build things like the project that we just saw which was the crawling robot example and this in this entire module we just explore another paradigm of machine learning which is slightly different than what we have seen before and then you move on to deep learning modules wherein you use neural networks you use tensor flow and you no know, create those things we use a cloud based service and or you, know, you will write your neural networks in that cloud based service run those pro, uh, program with a gpu enabled and uh, build your machine learning models uh, with you no know, state of the art accuracy overall all are the machine learning pro program which is for professionals has 10 plus real world projects more than 80 plus hours of live instructor led session just like what we are doing right now and more than 3 mentored hackathons or capstone projects that we do and overall we also know that sometimes a lot of people want to switch to a job right so we have a lot of interview prep sessions which 